There we go. Let's, there. Good to be with you all again. Where are my engineers in the room? Any engineers here? Raise those hands proudly. Well, this is a good social skill exercise for all of you. <laughs> Raise your hands. Come on. All right. And there we go. We got tons of engineers here. My dad's an engineer, so uh, I admire you all and the way that you think. Engineers are inventors, designers. They maintain all the things that we enjoy. Uh, and so without them, uh, life would be much more difficult. Um, some of you may be familiar with a, a well-known engineer uh, named Mark Rober. Uh, he's a YouTuber and our kids' uh, very wholesome YouTube channel where he just teaches us how things work and why the way that they work. And then sometimes he even comes up with silly experiments to teach us like creating squirrel obstacle courses in his backyard. Um, one of the experience or experiments that he did recently, um, well, maybe not recently, but we saw recently is we're kind of gearing up for the summer swim season. Uh, he decided to look into why your pool smells like chlorine. Uh, and most of us think it's just because we pour chlorine in it. Well, that's not actually uh, entirely true. Uh, chlorine uh, of, of water in swimming pools leads to the formation of a chemical called, and engineers will know this probably, trichloramine, which trichloramine is very potent in its smell. It can actually be very irritable on your skin or your eyes. So if you go swimming in a pool and you get red eyes, it's actually not chlorine, it's trichloramine. And trichloramine uh, is mostly noted when you go to like indoor swimming pools because it has this gas release and there's just not the same way for it to, to dissolve. Outdoor pools that get sunlight, the UV rays tend to dissolve it so you don't get that smell. But one of the things is he's going through this experiment, he wanted us to understand how much urine is actually in our pool. So how much urine do you swim in in your pool? And I want to just read you some information that this is going to be really enlightening for us. Uh, and when you have the debate on whether we should go to the beach or whether we should go to the pool, this might help. I'm a pool guy. Laura's a beach guy. So there's this healthy tension in our marriage of how we vacation. But uh, increased levels are more likely in indoor pools, by the way. But among the disinfection byproducts of concern is trichloramine, which can irritate the skin, eyes, and respiratory tract and has been implicated in the development of asthma. Pool staff, swimming instructors, and young children are believed to be particularly at risk. Trichloramine is formed when chlorine in pool water reacts with nitrogenous compounds such as urea which is your urine. A certain amount is released as gas and can accumulate in enclosed spaces. So we all know people pee in the pool. Okay, so this is just a kind thing. I'm gonna say, like, for the sake of everybody, don't pee in the pool. Like, you have learned now that trichloramine is not good for us. When you think, oh man, the chlorine's really strong, that's not what you're smelling. You're smelling other people's urine. So Please be a transformative learner. You've learned something today. Change your life. Don't pee in the pool, all right? This is a silly illustration how learning needs to change us. It's, it's one thing to learn something and, it's an, and know how it works. It's another thing to live differently, to change what you do because you now understand how things work. You now understand how they operate. And engineers are, are awesome because they go and they figure out how things work and they want to make sure that they operate properly or, you know, operate more efficiently. And as we study scripture, the Bible encourages us not just to be learners, but to be transformational learners. People who learn something and then are transformed, are changed. And so... This morning, my big idea is this. We are called to be transformational learners. And let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. And we'll be in there uh, this morning, and there's, there's really, we'll, we'll look at some context here just to kind of gain some understanding. This is on the heels of, of Jesus talking about judging others, and he gives this great parable that kind of highlights 
our own need to invest in our self-awareness, that maybe you're not as smart as you think you are, you're not as great as you think you are, and you need some help. And so Jesus says this, and we'll start in verse 39 just to kind of pick up some context this morning. He says, he also told them a a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. So I really want us to hone in here on verse 40 and as preparing for this message and thinking about um, our responsibility to be transformational learners, one of the things that stuck out in my study is Uh, we're reading through a book in our pastoral staff right now called The Vine Project. It's a follow-up to a book called The Trellis and the Vine, which our elders are are digging into again. Pastor Tally had me read this book when I first came on staff in 2012, and it shaped a lot of our spiritual thinking in terms of how we uh, structure our time in church and in discipleship. And one of the things that it highlighted was this theme that what does it mean to be a disciple really could be translated as learner or student. The Greek word uh, mathetides refers to a learner or student who is apprenticed to a teacher to learn from him. And back in February, we uh, took a Sunday and we talked about a vision for discipleship here at Calvary. And one of the things that I challenged us to think through was our walk with Christ as being an apprentice. And the four stages of apprenticeship are the teacher says, I do, you watch. Next stage is I do, you help. The next stage is you do and I help. Then the fourth stage is you do and I watch. And so there's this progression that takes place. And I I think it's important that we think of ourselves like an apprentice. And so to build on that, the, the text really could translate that you're a learner. You're a student. That you're someone who is committed to saying, I don't know everything. And, and you are not only carrying information or knowledge that I need, but you're also living in a way that I want to live. And so then you build your life around learning that. And I think in the West, there's, there's been uh, writers recently who have begun to make some real astute observations. And they've said, we've created a culture where you can be a Christian, but not an apprentice of Jesus. And I think that's really dangerous Because we can say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you do nothing to learn or to be transformed by learning as an apprentice of Jesus. In their book, uh, The Vine Project, Colin Marshall and Tony Payne say, learnership cannot be taught as a subset of the Christian life or as a stage in the Christian life. It is simply one way to describe the totality of a Christian life that I'm committed to learning, that I'm committed to growing in my understanding of how God has created things, how God intends for things to function, for how he wants me to know him and understand who he is, and thus, in light of that, understood who I am as his creation. And so, there's a couple observations that I wanna make for us just in verse 40. And so let's, let's dive into this in just a moment. But I wanna highlight in 2 Corinthians before we unpack Luke uh, chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18, Paul highlights this concept well in terms of being transformed. In verse 18, he says, And we all, with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So you're being transformed, if you're an apprentice of Jesus, to the pursuit and significance of your own glory, to following and living underneath the glory of God and being transformed to that image. That's an important pursuit for us if we are going to say, yes, I am a Christian who is an apprentice of Jesus. I'm practicing the way of Jesus. And so 
if we go back to Luke chapter 6 now, this verse, and he, he's not specifically scratching at discipleship here, but I think that this verse is enlightening. There's, there's kind of three nuggets here that we can take away. The first is that a transformational learner is not above his teacher. Look at this. A disciple is not above his teacher. And so there's a couple things that we could just draw from that. First off, do we acknowledge that you have a need for a teacher? So there's an assumption that if you are a disciple, if you are a learner, you have a teacher. Some of us don't want a teacher. We think, I graduated from school. I'm done having somebody over me grading my papers. I'm done having somebody who's saying, hmm, I think you missed what we were trying to get scratch at. Or you missed the, the learning objective. Or maybe you're not playing nice in the sandbox during recess. We all need a teacher. We all need somebody to uh, help us grow so that we can be transformed. You think about where you are in life right now and you say, I'm never gonna change if I'm not committed to learning and I'm never gonna learn if I don't pursue to have a teacher. Here's another question. Jesus asks his disciples in the New Testament, come and follow me. And he has this command that he gives them to leave what they're doing and pursue to sit under his tutelage. Do you follow and pursue your teacher? I think sometimes we live in a society that thinks, I just want everybody to come to me. I'm gonna sit here and until someone reaches out to me, I'm, I, 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 I'll you know, just sit here. But the Bible's full of opportunities where Jesus challenges us, the Lord challenges us. God says, knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given unto you. Follow me. These are all languages that the Lord puts in our plate to say, you're responsible to pursue learning from the rabbi. What an important mind shift for us to have if we are going to be a transformational learner or transformational learner that we're going to see that we're not above our teacher. And here's another question. This one struck me particularly. And are there areas of pride in my life that are inhibiting my ability to learn? The stereotypical things pop into mind. Gentlemen, we don't need an instruction manual to assemble something. We can just figure it out on our own. There's nothing that duct tape and super glue can't fix. My wife would tell you that the toilet needs more than that to get fixed. And so you need to really call a plumber. Um, I need somebody to teach me. And so I would ask you, Who's your teacher? We all have the supreme teacher in Jesus, but Jesus has designated under shepherds in life and in this world. Who is yours? Who is that person that you're pursuing to say, I want to not only know what you know, but I want to live like you live. And I'm going to give time and attention to that. Healthy learners not only listen to their teacher's words, but witness their words and action and seek to learn the way they live their lives. What are you, how did you do this? Help me understand, help me process. And sometimes that comes in very kind of natural or organic ways. Uh, this last week, every uh, week our pastoral staff is, is doing a specific study together for our own just spiritual growth and, and, and um, coaching and Pastor Tally is kind of leading this. And there was this question in our discussion that kind of just turned into um, some parenting coaching from John. You know, we're navigating, well, how do you deal with the different stages of trying to help your children grow and mature in the Lord? And, and you feel like you're coming up against a wall and you're just hitting that wall. And I'm like, I, I'm at a loss. And I just, he just had this one great line to me. He said, well, praise the Lord that your child is not the finished product of what God is doing in their life now. And I just needed to hear that from my teacher. Sometimes we need to spend time with our teachers simply so that they can care for us in a way that's gonna transform our own learning. So do you have a teacher and you're not above your teacher? Don't think I know it all, I'm better than them, I can do this you know, better than they can. No, learn from them. 
And if your youthfulness is stopping you from listening to the wisdom and counsel from an older generation, you're missing out. Secondly, the text, let's look at it again. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained. Let's pause. So Jesus is making an assumption here, everyone when he is fully trained. So he makes the assumption that you're training. If you're a learner, you are training. A transformational learner is committed to training. We all love the transformational highlight reels of somebody who's you know, said, you know what, my physical health is not what it should be, and I'm going I'm to you know, transform. And you, know, you can see in a 90-second reel somebody going from being you know, 500 pounds, and you know, over months and months and years, you see in the 90 seconds all the work that they put in to, to then shed the weight and get healthy. And I love that. The algorithm knows that I'm like, woohoo, these are awesome. But we miss out on those people who had to organize their life to be in the gym every day to meal plan, and they trained for months and months and months and months to get to where they are now. And most of us, we don't want to do that work. I want the transformation in 90 seconds. Can I just take a pill that asks nothing of me? Or can I, like, and I don't want to use that because some of us have real medical challenges, but we must commit to training. And this is meant to be a spiritual mindset. So do you look at your apprenticeship and your spiritual walk as something that you're giving effort to train in? So here's a couple questions for you. Is my secular knowledge surpassing my biblical knowledge? Are the things that are in this world and of this world, am I pursuing to understand them more than I want to understand God's word? When I was uh, a young adult in college, one of my favorite things to do was memorize the Celtics box score. And so then I could, you know, rattle off all these kind of statistics to prove my points that I was a better debater than everybody on which Celtics player was most important to the team, etc., and so my, my MBA stats knowledge was way more important to me than being transformed by the word of God. And so sometimes there's silly things, but sometimes there's things that are actually really unhelpful or I'm going to pursue the wisdom of the world more than I'm going to pursue the wisdom of God. Is studying scripture even on your radar screen? Is that something that you see value in? Have you experienced what this can do for you. And sometimes we can feel overwhelmed, like, where do I start? Yeah, that's a reasonable question. Where do I start? How do I understand this? There's all kinds of nuance. There's, you know, the original audience. There's authorship. There's historical context. There's language interpretation issues. How do I understand the word of God? Well, it it takes some training. So sit underneath somebody who's already trained and pursue that. And this will lead us to the second question. As we learn this information, I want to change my behavior. Am I learning God's way of thinking and perceiving? Do I view life like God views life? Am I thinking about others the way that Christ is thinking about others? These are important questions for us. And then finally, I think when you think about am I committed to training, Are you asking questions? That can be really important. Questions make a difference because questions need good answers. And good teachers will be willing to take questions. And they won't be threatened by them. They won't be offended by them because the inquisitive learning mind really just wants to know. Uh, My daughter Charlotte is, is that. She loves to ask questions. And sometimes it's very tempting to feel like I am, uh, you ever read the, the comics Calvin and Hobbes? Like, you know, he asks his father all these questions. I'm like, I could be like that. You know, like, how does the garage opener work? And Calvin's dad says, well, there's a man that lives above the garage and pulls a rope, you know, that, that opens it and closes it for us. Like, instead of having to talk about, like, the engineering of how the garage works. Don't take the easy way out. Look for a teacher who's willing to tell you the truth. And sometimes it's going to take time or sometimes it's going to take longer conversations. But we want to empower inquisitive learners. We want to be honest and say, hey, sometimes hard questions need good answers. 
And we're, we're not offended or threatened by those when we study God's word here at Calvary. And this is why, because we aren't learning a subject, we're learning a person. We're learning the person of God. We're learning his word so that we can live his way as his created being. And so if you are committed to being a transformational learner who recognizes that they're not above their teacher, a transformational learner who's committed to training, you're also going to find that a transformational learner will become like their teacher. And this is Jesus' ultimate aim for his disciples, that they will learn who he is as they are with him, and then they'll start to practice and live like he lives his life, and then they'll become like him. We're seeing this happening uh, more and more here at Calvary as people are, are listening to godly men and women, and they're beginning to learn how to, how to shape their life in this way. And so I'd ask you this question, are words taught being received and learned? Am I receiving counsel? Am I receiving the teaching of the word of God in a way that I've learned it and am living it? That's an important step for us. Here's another one. Has what I learned changed me? Sometimes we can be really good at collecting information, and then we do nothing with it. You heard today, you're going to go swimming. You're going to get out of the pool and go to the bathroom now, right? Let the information change you. And so step into a space where you can say, I want to learn so that I'm transformed, so that I can become like this person. The next one, I would say, have you organized your life to live as Jesus lived? We all need reorganizing. There's this great moment in uh, the process of selling our home back in um, 2019 when we, uh, our realtor had Amy Garland come in and, and reorganize our house and to stage it for all the photos that were gonna be taken to, to sell our home. And I was amazed. I was like, wow, I wanna live here now. <laughs> we got rid of all this junk that was like filling up our, our living room and like this, this is really attractive. Look at how big our home is. All we needed was to organize it in such a way that we would be able to be blessed by it. And I think that's probably true of our calendar it's probably true of our routines. Maybe it's true of your house. There's so much stuff that's cluttering your ability to commit to living and learning the way that God wants us to. Your schedule's too busy. There's too many things distracting you. There's things that you have deemed necessary that God doesn't deem as necessary. Have you organized your life to live as Jesus lives? There's a movement happening here at Calvary that, uh, as your pastor, I'm really excited about. And that's you all loving one another and discipling one another, learning together. And I just, out of curiosity, I'd like to see real briefly, if you are a man or a boy that is regularly meeting with other men at Calvary, would you just raise your hand that you're in a group? It could be monthly. It could be raise those hands high, okay, really high. This is what's taking place. People are meeting beyond just Sunday morning because Sunday morning is not aimed for us solely to, to be fed once a week. They're recognizing that if I'm going to apprentice Jesus, I'm going to have to organize my life in such a way that there's more intentional space and time for me to accomplish that. Uh, over the last year, uh, Adam Beam and Dave Spinelli and I got together and we invited a group of six young men to join us in some intentional uh, discipleship learning. And so over the course of each month, the guys committed to studying the Bible daily, journaling through that. We gave them a supplemental devotional book to kind of help with that process. They also are given a book each month that we commit to reading, and then we gather once a month for three to four hours, and we have multiple sessions. So we'll have a meal, we'll sit down, and we'll discuss the book that we read. We'll unpack, what are, what, so what? What are we gonna do with this? 
Then we'll have some specific time where we just listen to one another, share about what is God teaching me and what am I doing with that and trying to take time to affirm their experience of God and the character of God and the work of God in their life. And then we'll wrap up with maybe some specific targeted teaching by one of the leaders. And it's been a joy. These guys are growing. These guys are, are, are taking serious their own life. And I wanted you to get a glimpse of that. And so uh, we took some time. Connor uh, has been dabbling with the idea of a podcast. And so we want you to watch this brief video. Um, and we took some time to interview Isaac Coulomb and Harry LeBlanc. And they're both young guys in their 20s that have been members here, grew up here at Calvary. And they're just going to share a little bit about what being part of an intentional learning group has looked like for them. So take a look. So as you think about um, being a transformative learner, what's been the return on investment that you've seen in your life this last year? So I, I'm, I'm always blown away by the, the wisdom that's found in the Bible. I, I think, and I know for me, um, I can get kind of numb almost to the wisdom that's on the pages of the Bible because I'll be trying to do like a certain reading plan. Like I'm trying to get a couple chapters done a day so I can get through the Bible in a year. Uh, I, I, I did that once, or I'm trying to just read a passage for a devotional that I'm doing. And I don't, I don't spend the time that I should thinking about the words that are actually on the page. Instead, I just see them as a, a mark that I have to hit. And so that's one of the many reasons why I enjoy reading these books, because if you take a look at the, you know, the books that we've read, they each kind of, or there is some overlap, but a lot of them cover different aspects of biblical wisdom. Like Timothy Keller's Every Good Endeavor covers um, a lot about what the Bible has to say about a man or, or woman in their work. Um, or for example, live no lies talks about the spiritual battles that we have within our mind or um, Ken Sands book on reconciliation is all about Christian um, reconciliation and dealing with dealing and working through conflict. So I appreciate the, the deep dives that books give us on a, a certain idea a thesis or section of biblical wisdom because it forces me to think about those areas a lot more than I would on on daily basis. So it, it's really given me, I think, a, a deeper understanding. And the mind blowing thing is, is that I feel like I've only scratched the surface. So yeah, you, just, you learn more, you realize more how much you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> then you, you develop a hunger for wanting to to grow. Um, it's been neat to just see both of you. Uh, mature in, in different ways in your life. Harry, it's been fun to see you gain confidence in making decisions or just hearing about, you know, you share about work and being able to make decisions quicker, you know, like you're maturing in a way of saying like, okay, the Lord's equipped me and given me the skills to be able to do this. And now you're not having analysis paralysis as much. Right. Uh, right. Or, or you're learning to navigate that battle a little more accurately. And um, Isaac, you're slowing down and <laughs> seeing uh, the value in people, um, which is great to see. So if you were to encourage somebody who's thinking about being part of a, a, a group that's going to commit to learning or, you know, someone is attending Calvary Bible Church and saying, how can I get into a, a small gathering of people that really want to grow in their walk with the Lord? What would you want them to know? I'll let you take this one first, sir. Sure. I mean, I, I think the the big thing for me is like, you know, if, if you're on the fence, if you're not really sure if you should do it or not, I would I would say to you to just I would, you know, just just trust God and join because it's really I had no idea before I joined this group how much of an impact it would have on my life. Um it, but, you know, once I joined this group and started, you know, interacting with other um, followers of, of Christ, you know, guys who are serious about their their walk, um, it really just gave me a whole new lens and just, um, I guess, hunger to pursue my my relationship with Christ more. Cool. And you guys think about the value that small gatherings or small groups have added to your your spiritual transformation. 
Um, you just don't get it with a mass. I mean, right, you have a mass yeah. of people. I mean, as, as much as we want to say that we're a hundred percent ourselves and we're with right. a bunch of people, you know, I'm not going to be full blown Isaac when I'm in a yeah. full course of people just because it, you know, it's. I don't think it's it, it's rude to some, you know, it's, to some extent, but um, just it's also when, an investment of trust. Like you're you're investing in a smaller group. You're of not going to you're not going to talk about certain things yeah. in, a, in a group at a depth that you might in a smaller group, um, mm-hmm. especially just. Being able to really understand the people that you're around versus knowing them from a more surface level, yeah. I think, is very valuable. When you really understand someone and where they're coming from and their mm-hmm. situation, it's pretty hard to not, you know, relate in some sort of way or be connected in a way to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think, you know, when you're when you get together with, you know, a few people, so, you know, close or not in age, you know, our our group varies, you know, yeah. you know, good probably ten, twelve years for some people. Um, all walks of life, different stages of life, you know, Chris is, you know, well ahead of us in years. So, you know, he has a lot more wisdom to give us. Yeah. Um, the balding uh, stages come early yeah. for me. No, no, no. Um, so. Just don't say, uh, go on up, you bald head. Cause then I'm going to have to curse you in the name of the Lord. And a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of she bears are going to come out. And all, you know? um, so on that note, I just want to finish and just affirm both of you that I'm proud of the investment that you've made in your own walk. Um, it's a joy to see the Spirit of God birthing fruit from your walk and from the investment you've made to mature in Christ, um, to learn how to, to delight in the Lord, to glorify Him with your life. You guys have made the commitment to love one another. That, that's a love people. That's part of our mission. Uh, and then to, to make disciples. And, and in order to make disciples, we have to be a disciple. We have to be a learner. And so my encouragement to you both is you've committed to be a learner. And so this next stage is going to be, how am I going to invite others to learn with me? So I'm praying for you both in that way. And uh, thanks for being willing to share your testimony in this process. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So just a little glimpse and uh, the, the full version of that will come out at a later date. But I hope that you saw that um, the investment that those two guys made in their life uh, has been transformational. That they're not just collecting information, but that they're living a new life and that they're living a new way. Uh, And their mind is being strengthened and encouraged with the things of God. And this is something that I want all of you to experience. Now, it may not all happen the same way or in the same type of group, But I want you all to experience what it's like to be a transformational learner. And we've thought a lot about this in how are we as leaders here at Calvary helping you in this way. And we've used language of uh, open gathering and closed gatherings. And I want to bring that back up a little bit. Open gatherings like this morning is something that everybody's welcome to. And The purpose of an open gathering, really, we kind of focus on three things. We want to proclaim, praise, and publicize. We want to make those uh, known to you. A closed gathering really focuses on on training, on building trust and and transformation. And so an open gathering uh, invites anybody to attend. Uh, An open gathering often has an outward focus. Let's go live our lives outward again. An open gathering aims to proclaim, celebrate, and inform us. And then an open gathering is is a necessary component to the life of the believer because God said, do not forsake the assembling of the saints. But a closed gathering is, is a smaller gathering. And a closed gathering empowers examination and confession. I'm going to examine my life. I'm going to confess and deal with the sin and the things that are going on in my life. I want to be honest about the growth that God is asking me to to do. A closed gathering develops trusting relationships. Those are really important to your transformation because you need someone to be able to walk next to you in a way that they can love you enough to say hard things. A closed gathering trains in studying understanding and applying the word of God. That's part of our vision here at Calvary, that we would know, grow, and show. And a closed gathering invests in targeted spiritual transformation. And not everybody is going to know how to get into a closed gathering right away. And that's one of the ways that we want to try to help you. And so how we're helping you learn and be transformational learners is, is providing leaders that we were trying to develop leaders to imitate. 
People who are, are walking a godly life who have uh, measured faithfulness. Uh, that's how we've selected our elders. And it's a, it's a joy to see these men come in and model for us and, and use their giftingness. And it, it's, it's wonderful that we get to have that. And we're also trying to help others come up and serve our body in this way. And then we're trying to have gatherings. We're having our Sunday gatherings. We're having other open gatherings that are and essentially on ramps for you, attenders or members, to gather here, meet one another, build friendships or, or, or basic relationships, or even receive an invitation to try something that's smaller or closed or, or kind of invite only. And so we want these gatherings to happen, both large and small. And then we're trying to provide opportunities for relationships, that intentional discipleship relationships are being formed. And so one of the ways that we've decided to add a layer to support the elders of Calvary Bible Church is to introduce volunteers uh, that are, are given some uh, specific ministry titles and roles. And, and those individuals are uh, not being placed in these roles to control or run everything, but to coordinate with all of you. Because you are the saints that have been called to do the work of the ministry. The job of the elders is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so our desire is that we would help plug you all in. And so um, our ministry coordinators, uh, they do really three things. In support of the elders in equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, we're asking them to equip empower and entrust. And that language isn't new to you. You've heard me say that. That they're going to equip people who want to, to get smaller gatherings going. What do you need? Do you need resources? Do you need materials? Uh, do you need space? Can I help coordinate that? Do you need someone to walk alongside of you in that? Let me plug you into someone else. To empower you, to say, you can do this. We can give you the, the, what you need to accomplish what God is laying on your heart underneath the leadership of the elders of Calvary. And then entrust you to do that, to be able to say, yeah, we can, we can give this to you in such a way that you're going to, to open up opportunities. So I'll give you an example of how this kind of plays out. One of the things that we have for men is men's breakfast, and that happens monthly. And that's an open gathering. Any man can come. And it's an opportunity for guys to come, have some great food, uh, hear from the word of God, interact with other guys at their table, and then every uh, Saturday, first, second Saturday, Saturday, second Saturday of the month, the guys get to hear of opportunities of how they can plug in with other guys. And people who are leading some of these smaller gatherings are inviting other guys to join them. Our young men's cohort is uh, gonna wrap up in September, and they're gonna split off. And I've asked our young guys to say, okay, you're gonna step into leading a new one, and you're gonna look to invite six other guys who are the next batch that are going to go through this commitment to learning and being spiritually transformed. And so that's what we're asking you to think and consider and participating in is that uh, we're still learning and ironing out what this process looks like, but we want to let you know that we've asked three individuals to step into some specific roles. Um, and so I'm going to ask if the elders would come and join me on stage because we, we'd like to pray for these three people. Uh, one of them may or may not be here. She had a sick child, but... Uh, Mary Sharon has stepped away from being the conference director uh, for Ladies' Day Apart. She's not leaving. She's still going to support that. Uh, but Jessica Clayer has agreed to be our next conference director for Ladies' Day Apart. And then we've decided to have a men's ministry coordinator and a women's ministry coordinator. And so uh, Ron Poitras has already been leading men's breakfast and has been kind of serving in this. So I'm going to ask Ron if he would come up. Ron is going to be serving as our men's ministry coordinator. And Tracy Durant is going to be stepping into the role of women's ministry coordinator. And Tracy served on past women's ministry boards. And both of these individuals have been longtime people here. And their desire is, just, is to help us kind of get some of these things going. For women's ministry Particularly, we're going to see things that uh, are new and that maybe hadn't happened for a while. So I'm going to ask the three of them, if they just come up, we just like to bless them and affirm them as they step into these roles. Uh, these roles are meant to serve you. Uh, their roles are not meant to control. They're not meant to say, oh, they get power. 
Their, their job is to support us as elders to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so uh, we're excited for the next season that God has and that these three have been willing to faithfully step into these spaces and say, hey, we just want to serve our body and help them. So uh, we're just going to lay hands on them and pray over them uh, as ministry leaders uh, and servants here at Calvary. And I would encourage you to pray for them. Um, they have a hard job um, because they've got to love us, right? And love, and love you. And sometimes that's difficult because we're sitting in a room with maybe 500 people. There's 500 opinions on how things should go. And so let's love them. Let's pray for them. They, they're asking the biggest question that we as elders ask all the time. What does God want us to do? What does God want us to do? Not man, what does God want us to do? So let's just pray that God would use them to equip, empower, and entrust you. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for Jessica for Ron and for Tracy and their willingness to step into these serving roles. Lord, I pray that you'd give them wisdom and discernment on how to best lift up our body, how to best connect with people to help them become transformational learners, that they'd be able to get into to relationships and groups that are gonna spur them to apprentice Jesus, that we'd be able to say that we're not just a Christian, but that we are practicing the way of Jesus. Lord, protect them from the spiritual warfare that's gonna come their way in a growing church, Lord. Strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, I pray that our congregation would not be a, a people with a spirit of complaining and criticism, but that they would be a spirit of investment and of innovation and, Lord, a willingness to step in and serve and love one another well. God, you told us that the world's going to know you by the way that we love one another. So I pray that you would help these ministry leaders to be a big part of what you're doing here at Calvary. We thank you for what you're doing. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, thank you, three. And so as you pray for them, as we are going to hear of things to come in July, Tracy's been uh, planning for the end of July, kind of like a ladies ministry launch. So ladies, you'll get to hear more of that. She's, her, she's kind of working through some ideas of what do you want? And she's going to take all of the things that matter to you ladies and say, how can I help make those things happen? And how can I help you make those things happen? And I would like to encourage you ladies you're doing some of these things already. It's pretty awesome. Small groups are started. Bible studies are happening. Moms are meeting together. And so we just want to help put some trellis underneath the vine that is growing here at Calvary Bible Church. So we don't want to become slaves to trellis, but we also want to help put some structure in place to nurture the growth that the Spirit of God is doing here at Calvary. I said this back in February, and we're going to land in the same spirit today. You are responsible for your life. You are responsible to commit to being a transformational learner. You are responsible to see that you're not above your teacher. You are responsible to be committed to the training. You are responsible to become like your teacher and the ultimate teacher, Jesus. Be responsible for your life. Take that seriously. And if you want help, we want to help you. And that's why we're putting those three in place, because we care. We want to help you. And we may not always do that perfectly, but we're going to give it the good old college try and, and try to love one another well. And so let's just pray together that the Spirit of God would continue to move and work in us as we commit to being transform transformational learners. Father, we thank you that your son Jesus came down and loved a sinful people and people who could do nothing to regain a right relationship with you and so that you made a way to us. Lord, thank you that you have offered yourself as the supreme holy teacher that we can trust, that we can learn from, and that we can model our life after. I pray for each individual in this room today. Help them to see you as their teacher and help them to delight in learning. Lord, I pray that each of us would commit to being transformational learners. And I pray that as we are transformed that Calvary Bible Church would be filled with believers who don't just say that they're Christians, but they live their lives like the way that Jesus lives his. Help us today in your name we pray, amen.